Last year saw lots of crazy developments in the world of generative artificial intelligence with both consumers and companies alike trying lots lots of new things. As we get get into 2024, what lessons did companies learn? What mistakes did they make? And what will the new year bring? That's next up on Today in Tech. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Joining me to discuss business use cases of generative AI is Sandeep Sachetti. He is the executive vice president at Walters Kluwer. Welcome, Sandeep. Thank you, Keith. Really looking forward to our conversation and Happy New Year to you and to your viewers. All right. Thank you. Uh, Let's uh, talk a little bit about the background of the company of Walters Kluwer um, and then from your perspective, what did you guys do as a company? Uh, what were some of your customers uh, experiencing? Uh, and how did uh, Gen AI technologies have an impact for you guys in 2023? It's a long question, but um, I think there's a, I, I, there's a lot of that I want to unpack before we get into some of these other issues. So first of all, Keith, thank you for the opportunity. And I got to tell you, I, I have this pleasure of working with this amazing company it's a 185 year company that's based out of Netherlands that really spans the globe and started as a book publisher, but today is nothing but a book, book publisher. It's, it provides information solutions to professionals and expert solutions to professionals that, that we serve across multiple domains, in particular health, tax and accounting, financial compliance, mm-hmm. and regulatory, uh, legal and regulatory. Okay, so I, I I guess if I was an accountant, I would I would definitely know about this company and and the the materials that you produce, correct? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So if you talk to uh, uh, your evening party and your friends, chances are that you have not heard about Walters Kluwer, and you might say Walters who? <laughs> but if you are hanging out with professional friends of yours, I guarantee you we are in their top one or two uh, list. And very importantly, if you end up in an unfortunate situation at the emergency room or you're filing your taxes or you happen to talk to your lawyer, chances are they are using our product to help you become better and serve you in your various walks of life. Okay, so within within now the company uh, over the last year, what what were some of the the areas of generative AI that uh, had a big impact on on the company and what what you are now developing probably in 2024 and beyond. Uh, wow, what, what a wonderful question, Keith, and it brings up so many memories for me of 2023. <laughs> so let me kind of. <laughs> it was only a month by, ago. <laughs> yeah, well, but, well, but really the entire year of 2023 is what I'm talking mm-hmm. about, and the journey that I went through, that I think all of us went through, was you know almost like a a roller coaster ride and let me describe some of my own personal roller coaster journey and and I'll weave in the the company story within that okay the, the first quarter was very much of a we were all kids in a candy store and it seemed like everybody and their uncle was utilizing chat gpt uh for various things of writing jokes to articles to <laughs> you name it it was there And at a time, it felt like it could do anything and everything, including disrupt professions. Remember the number of articles that were starting to come out and jobs will disappear and everybody's life will completely be disruptive. Uh, And then came Chad GPT-4 or GPT-4. And then came the, the big letter signed by what, six, 800? uh, You have the Elon Musk letter. Yeah, yeah. We got to stop this. We got to pause because we don't know what the heck we are doing. And of course, then we all recognize that, well, chat GPT, as good as it is, these language models have this fundamental challenge of they make things up. Mm -hmm. And that's when we also in our company realized that while this is a Swiss army tool that can do multiple things and can really advance the ball, we have to really design and rethink our processes where it's going to be useful and where it needs augmentation and management. And I think that's the journey that we went and started with. Okay. And towards the end of the year, I think we, what we ended up with was 
a bunch of really strong hypotheses and use cases that we are strong and you know sure of driving forward on okay and and again a lot of the the things that you do uh, at, at your part of the company uh, revolve around document uh, management um, compliance issues obviously uh, are some of the things you know what were some of the things you discovered that um, generative AI tools could could benefit your comp you know the company and what you were producing that's again a great question yeah uh, what I have to tell you is that because we work in I work in compliance uh, issues uh, and my division is focused on financial compliance and corporate compliance mm -hmm. what we find is that the word compliance sounds very simple but every bank every financial institution every corporation has to deal with a plethora of compliance issues with the various regulators that govern them mm -hmm. and historically this was a sleepy area if you look before the dot frank days and before the financial crisis in 2008-9 uh, era it was a sleepy area things would change every few years but now the speed of change is so fast mm -hmm. and so enormous that no bank can satisfy themselves and their regulators in an effective manner without the support of experts like us. Okay. Fortunate is that we have experts in-house who are lawyers, who are tra trained uh, compliance experts, who are often ex-regulators and ex clients you know chief compliance officers on our on, on, are on our staff so they have historically read these documents right translated them into actionable outcomes and packaged them into solutions for our customers to uh, use every day the challenge of course keith is that these set of regulations have become so ginormous mm -hmm. literally we are dealing with hundreds of thousands of regulations per year that are changing and some of these regulations can be thousands of pages long across multiple documents. So how do you keep up with all of this? Even our experts are time constrained. Right. And to digest, this is where AI, this is where generative AI can help us and is already helping us. Okay. So a lot of a lot of these a lot of these 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 employees that were doing all of this reviewing and 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 summarizing and looking at all these new rules. Um, were they then basically using ChatGPT and other other tools like that to help them summarize a lot of these new regulations so that they could then um, digest it a lot faster? Did it make them more? You know, did, do you feel like it made them more efficient? Um, and then, as a follow up, was there any hesitance on their part because of the the because of all of those articles about the job thing, or did they embrace it and go, "Oh, I understand. This is going to really help me be faster and better." And, um, and and more helpful than than I was before. Not that I wasn't helpful before, but you know, uh, more more efficient. There, there's there's a lot in your question. Yeah, so let I... me start unpacking that <laughs> okay. uh, one at a time. I I think the first thing is that uh, we have embraced new tools over decades. So bringing in new tools to help our experts and our customers is within our DNA. We've been utilizing AI over last decade already. Now, there are a new set of tools that are emerging with generative AI. And what we are realizing and what our people have realized themselves. Remember the, the first comment that I made? Everybody is using it at home. Mm -hmm. So that familiarity with these new tools is already there when the employee walks into our office and starts to work on their everyday work. So they themselves are curious as to what can I do with these tools within my job mm -hmm. and improve the efficiency of my processes and add more value to our customers' experiences. The, the thing that we had to make sure was that we are making our data secure and not leaking it into the public domain, okay. if you will. Okay. So we needed to, uh, first and foremost, create secure environments work with partners that would maintain the privacy and sanctity of our unique data sets. So that's what first thing that we did. Okay. The second thing that we did was educated our employees, the power of these new tools. 
And that required us to actually dissect our entire workflow into smaller chunks so that we understand where these new tools can add value and where human expertise is incredibly important to manage the hallucina hallucination and this probabilistic nature of these new models. Mm -hmm. And I, and I, I want to get to some of those, those um, problems and hurdles, but before I get to, I, there was one other question I had before I wanted to get to that. And that is, sure. um, so, you know, you, you focused on a lot of the capabilities to review, digest, summarize, um, you know, generative AI and chat GPT, like you said in the beginning, was a Swiss army knife where you could do a lot of these things. Um, and I've seen examples of, of, of IT writing code with it, um, you know, marketing, creating images, creating, you know, written words, text releases, poems, jokes, like you mentioned. Um, <laughs> did, did, were the, these other aspects of the creativity part of it um, also utilized within their company, or did you did you just hone in on on this this reviewing and summarizing um, for that particular part of the business? Or did you see other uh, examples or use cases of, of other employees trying you know new things creatively? Absolutely. the The good news is that we are a company that starts with customer pain points first. Okay. Before getting excited about technology tools. Okay. It's we are not a hammer looking for a nail. There you go. We have nails or screws <laughs> and we find the right tool to utilize, right? So I'll give you a couple of examples where it turned out that your point is absolutely spot on. Because we serve deep domain experts in our customer bases, over years we have created homegrown languages that we code in these domain specific languages. Now, if you look at GitHub Copilot, for example, mm -hmm. it can do, you know, code writing in Java, it can do code writing in Python, C++, et cetera. But our homegrown domain specific languages are not available with any of these platforms. So we had to write our own customized large language model algorithms basically fine tune them yeah. on our domain expertise and domain specific languages, which we have millions of lines of code written in. So there we go. Now, this is an area which required significant upskilling of labor. And there was language that only was unique to Walter Skluwer. So now we have utilized chat GPT type of tools, not chat GPT, but chat GPT right, right. type of tools that are built for specific languages that we have internally that our coders are able to benefit from efficiency and effectiveness and write, write higher quality code much faster. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, and also then you, you mentioned some of these other hurdles around hallucinations and, and accuracy. That is something that you discovered in a lot of these early experiments, correct? It, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And it feels like, again, since since your work is all about um, compliance issues, it feels like accuracy is is tremendous. Do you have any exa like? Do you have any examples of of where you got a hallucination? Or, uh, I mean, obviously, without giving any kind of like corporate secrets away, um, can you give me any general examples of where you you got an answer you didn't expect or that was incorrect? Uh, yeah. Yes, and, and I think uh, these language models can actually give you a lot of false sense of security initially. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened when we were experimenting early in the year last year. And, you know, so I'll give you one more example, if you will. Okay. So we have, um, uh, we are the largest registered agents in the country. And what a registered agent is nothing but a uh, uh, an entity that can receive legal documents on behalf of its customers. So if you remember any of the legal shows on TV, uh, you know, you have a person that walks up to you and says, are you key cha? And you say, yes, I am. Or consider yourself served. <laughs> right. But the same thing happens with companies and on companies, when they get served legal notices, we are the ones that receive the legal notice on behalf of these corporations that we represent. Okay. So as part of that service that we offer to our corporate clients, we received last year somewhere in the neighborhood of 45 million pieces of legal notices. Okay. Okay. 
massive gigantic amount of paper comes into our office 45 million is not a uh, thing that you would imagine otherwise this is actual paper that's actual paper so they're not even sending you this electronically no because okay. it's legally required to be served oh okay okay so we read this we <laughs> decipher what is the nature of action we summarize that action we send it on to the right person at the corporation that we represent so that they can appear in court or act on that legal document in the right timely fashion. Okay. So this is what we have done for 125 years. And we are the masters of it. But think about the speed at which this is happening and the response rate that our clients are needing to meet. And so initially we did a very small controlled study using these new language models. And it turns out that it did an amazing job almost all the time, mm -hmm. except when it did not. <laughs> well, what, what and, were you using the tool? What were you using the tool to do just to, to analyze the text? Uh, analyze the text and figure out the nature of action and certain other okay. parameters from that. Okay. And it came back with good answers, not even just good answer, great answers, except every once in a while it was making some facts up by itself. And that's when you scr start scratching your head and say, ah, because these models are probabilistic in nature, this is not going to work as is out of the box. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you really need to manage this experience, manage this workflow effectively where the language models are utilized at the right stage with experts as both fact checkers as well as quality control and manage even the language models effectively with prompt engineering, fine tuning, yeah, and you know your uh, new approaches of RAG, et cetera. It, is, so, is that why you then started developing or working with your own data sets and other language models rather than going with with more of an open source system such as OpenAI or um, was there a different reason then perhaps that you were no, I think I think you're you're spot on. It's mm. it's a, it's a, you know the things that you can do with prompt engineering, the things that you can do with uh, uh, fine tuning, which requires tremendous amount of your own data, if you will, mm -hmm. and very much you have to think about uh, this RAG approach, uh, retrieval of augmented generation, as a way to harness the power of these language models and yet be focused on the data that you have. The proprietary nature of our data allows us to get the maximum and the best of both worlds, if you will. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then if you if you layer that on top of uh, our experts on top, that's how we make sure that when you need to be right, by the way, that's our tagline as a company. When you need to be right, you utilize us. And compliance is an area where you can't be approximately right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, a, a regulator would not be acceptable to say, a bank saying, oh, yeah, we tried our best. Uh, this is what our language model gave us. Mm -hmm. well, no, mm -hmm. no, no. You either followed the rules or you did not follow the rules. So there's no such thing as close enough. <laughs> you got that right. So our customers are demanding for a reason, and that's why they rely on us for yeah, a reason. Yeah. And these language models help, but they don't replace the expertise that we have. Yeah, and I think when when we talked ahead of the show, you talked to me about you. You had a great phrase where you were saying that you're still seeing a need for uh, an expert in the middle, and that was the, the the terms that you used. Do you feel like generative AI will get to the point where you might not need an expert in the middle? Um, or, you know, do you think that it can ever achieve the 100% or moving forward, we're always going to have at least at least one human, if not many humans that are monitoring the outputs of some of these? Like if, uh, if so you had to answer this question in a couple of layers, like, again, if I ask a security guy, uh, you know, if you're ever going to get to 100% security, they'll say, no, absolutely not. They'll never <laughs> uh, they'll never commit to 100% security. And I'm, I'm wondering if it's the same thing with with Gen AI now, too. Uh, yeah, well, in a in a way, it might be the same, but it's also slightly different. <laughs> I think uh, uh, context matters. There are problems where 
error rates are actually not just a a bug but a feature and <laughs> it's okay right the probabilistic stochastic nature of some of these models are not a bug they're a feature this is what these models are built on the variation that you get in language actually makes the the written part more interesting if it was if then else always guess what it would not be writing any interesting prose that you get excited about from chat gpt right so it's a feature it's not a bug <laughs> but this feature needs to be managed and i think this is where what we are realizing and what we have concluded for ourselves is for certain type of use cases we need to benefit from this feature and these variations are actually powerful marketing messages mm-hmm. uh, job descriptions minor variations are actually a good thing that said for exacting requirements of our compliance experts or legal experts or lawyers doctors etc which is the professions that we serve we really need to manage that and given the probabilistic nature again of these uh, underlying models i think human beings and experts are always going to be needed in the loop yeah yeah what's amazing to me is that you have such a tool that can be used for both purposes the, you know there is this creative variation idea that would benefit many different organizations and companies but at the same time the same general tool or the same you know concept of tool would be used for accurate results and so if you're looking for accuracy there is some things but it's not completely 100% uh, but on the other hand like you said if you know i, I if i asked chatgpt to write an interesting poem i'm not looking for accuracy on a poem right you're looking for creative use of language and things like that so um i just think it's cool that it's the same tool can give you you know different types of results depending on again what you're asking it right exactly exactly so you know i think a lot of people are complaining about hallucinations and i actually think to your point it's the reason why we getting excited about it but at the same time it's the same reason why we should be exceptionally cautious and have the experts or have other mechanisms to overcome some of these you know variations that you're going to get for the same question that you're going to ask yeah yeah so you know do you think that companies another issue that's popped up is the idea of when you're selecting a lar- large language model or um you know looking for a single partner or a, a tool to use do you do you feel like companies are going to start spreading out the types of llms that they're using and the types of tools that they use depending on what results they're looking for it feels like for your compliance area you're going to want something that's highly accurate but maybe your marketing group would be interested in more of these variation type creative tools and that necessarily isn't the same LLM right uh, you're absolutely yeah. right so uh, you know th- look uh, for companies to be successful and spread the the usage of AI and generative AI across the company across all kinds of processes they do need scale they do need standardization they do need uh, security they do need protection of their data and hence we tend to go towards selecting one or two players that are likely to be our partners for the long run okay because they provide us the infrastructure that said it's still too early in this game to completely settle and look at nobody else other than the one partner that you may have chosen right that's a mistake also so what we are doing is picking the right partners where we do need scale and standardization and protection but at the same time remaining nimble and open as google's gemini comes on board or cohere comes on board etc to experiment smartly so that we can learn and leverage these capabilities yeah. in narrow domains where that new exceptional new capabilities are important for us to be both in touch with and benefit from all right so is it is it still is it still the wild west out there in terms of companies that are coming out with new models and new new tools uh or do you think 2024 might be a, a year where the dust settles 
Um, I, I, and again, it's hard to it's weird to talk about technology in a one year time frame, but that's how quickly everyone embraced generative AI. You know, last year. So you know, who's to say that maybe this will be another big year and and or are things going to settle down and slow down a little bit as companies take stock of what they've done and what they want to do? Like, you have a general sense of what, what, what's going to happen this year? Can I be, it's going to be both. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you want, you don't I, want to pick I, an either or. Yeah. You can say both. Well, well, I'll, I'll well, allow well, it. I think it's a, I'm going to tell you why it's both, why I'm in the camp of both. The reason is that this technology is still evolving mm-hmm. and you know, standard stand new standards will deter, get uh, determined. Uh, new language models will get uh, created. Additional parameters will get added. We are now onto trillions of parameters, and I think that scale of development and efficacy is going to continue to be driven by the science of the 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 uh, the models. Mm-hmm. That I don't think is going to slow down. At the same time there is going to be this notion of that now we have all heard about generative AI and AI and what it's capable of and companies like ourselves and many others will start to action, not just talk okay, and go from pilots to in market and go broader with value propositions that our customers are going to begin to feel the benefits of. So far in 2023, it was largely talk and largely education and a lot of marketing hype. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That hype will start to deliver results. Right. So you don't think it's going to be another it, so you don't think it's going to be another year of pilot projects for a lot of, of companies or at least the ones that have already been started. Like it, 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 if you've already started one, you're going to you're going to be itching to get towards the, the finish line with with your project if it's working. Um, it doesn't say yeah, it doesn't I, mean I, that, that you're not going to start other projects. Um, but it does mean that's it, that it could be time to like, all right, it's time to um, either stop or go, I guess, on on some of these things. Yeah, and, and again, I go back to it's not about technology; it's about the customer and the pain points that you're addressing for the customer. Yeah, and so there are pain points and customer sets that are needing help now, and those are the problem sets that we are picking first to you know, implement these new capabilities for so that we can serve them well immediately. And and this set of problems that we address is going to continue to expand, if you will. I, 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 I believe that's going to be the case for most companies. So rather than chasing the technology, chase the customer need. Mm-hmm. And I think this technology is there to serve us quite effectively. Uh, but you have to be careful in what you choose to utilize. Because if we just look at generative AI and its capabilities, then I think everybody is in this danger of creating chatbots after chatbots. <laughs> and that's unlikely to satisfy your customers. Yeah. I, and that brings me back to another question. When earlier we were talking about some of these early experiments that a lot of companies were doing, your, your company, we were doing it here as well. Um, is there a danger of, of us hyping up the technology so much that when someone experiences the technology and it doesn't produce the result that they're looking for, that they might just go, oh, this thing stinks, or, you know, I'm not going to use it. Or is, is, do, you, do you get a feeling from either, you know, experiments that you've done or the, the attitude of people at your company that, okay, we understand that it might not have produced the, the results we were looking for, um, we, you know, and then, and then go and then dive deeper into it. Or, or do, you know, or is there a danger of people going, "Oh, this is overhyped, and uh, it's not as good as we thought"? Because early, early AI stuff, maybe two years ago, in the image creation space, they were the, these pictures were horrible. But now you're looking oh, at it, oh man, go, yeah, uh, people with six, six fingers, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, missing toes. <laughs> yes, that was horrible. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> I guess I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm glad there's more people that are on the optimism side of things rather than the ones that just look at something and go, ah, oh, that stinks. And then they move on to something else. Um, I'm just wondering what, what, what you're hearing out there in from your colleagues or other, other people that you've talked to about this. Well, as I told you uh, in my previous uh, points, that we employ a lot of experts in-house to serve 
are external experts. So we have experts serving experts. And what we do effectively across the company very nicely is actually utilize the tools that we have created and is to serve our internal experts first mm -hmm. because they're the voice of our customer. And when it passes muster with them, it's only then that we expose it to our clients. Okay. And that gives us this both this confidence that we are not serving tools out there for the sake of the shiny toy of the day. Yeah. But it does make a meaningful difference to our own internal experts life that it will not just pass muster, but will actually make a meaningful difference to their daily work experience. Mm -hmm. So we are careful, we are thoughtful, we might be, you know, not the first one in market, but we are certainly the one that our customers rely on day in, day out. Right, right. So that's been our experience and it seems to serve us quite well effectively. Okay. And and we were talking earlier about that, the letter that, that Elon Musk and all those other experts were talking about. Do you get a sense that there's any attitudes like that, that, that AI could get out of control at some point? Or do you have most people kind of brush those concerns out? I mean, again, there was big drama at the end of last year with the open AI leadership. Um, I'm wondering if people are concerned about that from the business world as well. Yeah, it's, it's it's like worrying about overpopulation on Mars. <laughs> uh, so, I, look, it may be w valuable for some people to worry about that as a philosophy a, a, um, uh, argument, a philosophical argument. Yeah, and of course, that's a it's a good thing that society is concerned about these challenges and the possibilities that could unfold in future. So, I'm not I'm not against it. I'm not wanting to brush them off. But what, from a practical standpoint, I don't see it. Okay. The potential and the upside is so large, so large to serve humanity better and improve the human condition that we are existing today, whether it's climate change problems or whether it's uh, uh, the daily issues of compliance or health or tax. or These are complex topics that require way more than what our human capacity is today. Okay. And I want to end and end the episode. We're just talking to you about uh, a personal experience that you had before the show. You were telling me that um, you used ChatGPT. Was it ChatGPT or was it another tool that you used um, to help so, plan plan a road trip? I, I, yeah, I, so I, I have a couple I, questions I, I want to put you on the spot for. If that's okay. Absolutely, okay. absolutely. It was ChatGPT. Okay. Although I do use Bard extensively and uh, Bing as well. Yeah. Uh, in this one, I just happened to have picked ChatGPT as the the reason for. Okay. So tell me what you were gonna you were you were planning to do and how you used the tool. So uh, Keith, I'm 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 going to reveal a lot of, a lot about myself. I'm not a planner. <laughs> That's okay. And, uh, certainly in my personal life. Uh, at my at my work life, I'm like the utmost planner. That said, on personal front, I'm not a planner. So last minute, we were like, where are we going to go as a family for Christmas break? And so I, I typed in uh, chat GPT, give me some suggestions for a trip for three adults. And it gave me, you know, nice uh, locations in Europe. It gave me some nice locations in US. And I said, look, I don't want to travel on a plane okay holiday traveling on a plane is a disaster right and these are places i've already been in and this is my other set of couple of other requirements and it came back with two really really interesting suggestions which i had not even thought of and those two was were savannah georgia mm -hmm. and Asheville, north carolina now in a million years those two places would not have been on my list but turns out, I said, look, I'm talking about large language models to everybody. Let me try it myself. Yeah. And not only that, so we did end up going to Asheville, North Carolina. Okay. And did, did uh, you I, then ask for other suggestions of what to do when you were there? Yes. That kind of thing? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I was going there. And so I asked for uh, restaurant recommendations because we have certain dietary restrictions. Sure. I'm a vegetarian. Uh, and uh, I asked for uh, where can I stay and what else can we do there. And to be honest with you, by and large, it was spot on. Okay. It suggested some amazing restaurants that we would not have otherwise looked at. 
uh, things to do also. But surprisingly enough, it did miss quite a few as well that we ended up discovering locally. Okay. And yes, it did get a couple of restaurants that were made up. Okay, so, <laughs> so uh, you know, okay. Now, so of course, that's what I'm interested in now is like, how did it, it made up a restaurant? What, what, what does that mean? Well, I, I, I wouldn't go, maybe it did not make up the full thing, but it was creative enough in terms of uh, when we looked it up, the restaurant was not there. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> So, yeah, so uh, in that case... Sound, in the, it did sound very plausible, though. Okay. In that case... <laughs> it may have been there previously. That's possible. <laughs> if, we, if we look at the balance between accuracy and creativity in this, you're looking more for accuracy of results of things to do, um, where you're also then kind of looking for some creativity of maybe some interesting, fun places that you might not have gotten through other, other searches. So, so this is where I would say, you know, if you were to give an overall grade to this experience <laughs> of a chat GPT, I'd say it was a A minus to B plus. Okay. Uh, it allowed me to explore an area which I would have never otherwise. Right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it, it's an A plus on that. It gave me recommendations on a specific need of mine of uh, vegetarian restaurants. Sure. That were, yeah, that's Certain that's where it's thing. accurate versus the the create the creative part, right? So yes, it did get a couple of things wrong, but in the big scheme of things, how much additional anxiety or uh, you know cost did it impose on me? Yeah, yeah, I, hardly anything, hardly anything. So I'd let it be a pass on that. Um, so overall, I'd say in that type of situation, a couple of errors here or there doesn't bother me doesn't mar my experience overall all right cool yeah and, and again uh, uh, kudos to you for for trying that 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 on a on a vacation i'm not sure if i'm ready for that yet but uh, good job there uh all right uh again thanks uh thanks sandeep for joining us on the show uh it was a pleasure talking to you about uh, how gen ai was working at your company thanks again Thank you, Keith. It was a pleasure talking to you, and I really enjoyed our conversation. All right. That's all the time we have for today's episode. Don't forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel, add any comments that you have below. Join us every week for new episodes of Today in Tech. I'm Keith Shaw. Thanks for watching.